Thank you all so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Zaiste and Martina and all the excellent FFConf organizers. This has been a really wonderful conference. So thank you very much. And I, I have to open my talk by saying I really love craft. And I, I don't do all of these things, but I, th these are things that make my heart sing in, in many ways. You know, I, when you see you know, folks working with chisels and planes, when, you know, growing things from seed and brewing their own beer and roasting their coffee and making their own clothes and whatnot. And I, I have some chickens at home and I cobbled together a chicken coop out of reclaimed lumber and stuff. And I, I, this, is, this is part of uh, the aspect of making that, that I enjoy the most. And, and I started to wonder, is like, why, why is this the case? You know, like, what, what is it about craft that is, that, that fills some, some place in my heart. And, and I was, you know, there are a few aspects here. We got the, the aspect that it's nice to, to build things and see them grow and, and, and see them become bigger. And if, if the craft is done well, which is something that any of us can do with some experience, or you perceive a, a master craftsperson's result, you, you enjoy the, the quality of it, especially as it compares to uh, things that are not crafty. You can have like the uh, expressive creativity aspect of these things uh, that you know you can you have an object or or, or something in real life which which expresses something that, that you that you need to say and and the object can can be uh, fit for its purpose in the sense that it does its job very well in a way that uh, maybe a sort of pre-built solution does not do. And then as you do it, um, it, it's wonderful to start new things because you can only get better, right? You can't get worse at them. Except for my bowling last night where I started with a strike and then I had zero in the next two frames. But uh, and then if, I, if I think about like what, what's, what's the contrast? You know, what, what is a thing which is not crafty? And I left the slide blank because you know, the, the slides will go out somewhere and I didn't want to be quoted uh, as saying any particular thing is not crafty. But if I give a couple examples, you know, like, there's only so far you can go as a maker of fast food. Like, you make things that fulfill a need in the world, but there's no progression and there's no expressivity uh, of, of what you do, unfortunately, as part of you know, the system of the world we live in. Or like furniture made out of particle board or something. And, and there's something about these mediums that make it so that you can't, uh, they, they don't have this aspect of, of craft. That, that to me, a, a crafty thing is produced on the scale of, of humans, right? And, and the classic example of this is woodworking with hand tools. You see the folks with their chisels and their planes and, and whatnot, and they make these beautiful uh, dovetailed boxes without any nails or fasteners or anything like that, and, and you perceive this and you say, ah, this is right. This is, this is on my scale. And in the same way, uh, I admire my sister. She's doing this year. Um, she's only wearing clothes which she made herself. I was like, wow, <laughs> that, that, that's pretty cool stuff. At the same time, uh, in our lives, we're, we're, we're disconnected a lot from uh, from from basic things, right? We we see our vegetables in a, in a supermarket, and, and we never see the plant growing. And and craft, in a way, uh, starts with these basic things, and, and, and you know starts at the roots of practice. But it doesn't stop there, and it can, you know, create new and exciting stuff as well. And I, I include like wearables in this stuff. Folks making robots and like wonderful. Um, lighted things that they wear that react to different aspects. I, I find that very crafty as well. So I, 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 could, I was wondering about like what, what, what craft is. Okay, you can go to the dictionary, of course, and all the things I've been saying is part of the first definition. But if you notice, uh, on the second part, there's a more deceptive aspect, uh, which uh, craft is, is guile, right? And guile being, you know, all these uh, negative words. And so guile is also the name of a, a scheme implementation, which I maintain. Uh, co-maintain along with uh, two other people. And I've been co-maintaining this scheme uh, since about 2009 or so, working in it for since maybe 2003, maybe. And, and my focus on this has been, um, it, it has been the compiler side, the compiler and virtual machine and, and guile scheme. And to me, I find that, that guile scheme is a, is a scheme that, that embodies for me many of these things that I find nice about craft and other, other parts of my life. And so in this talk, I would like to give you an introduction to um, Gal Scheme and, uh, so that we can all uh, make some uh, programs with love and joy to solve our problems, both big and toy. Right? So <laughs> we're going to start from the smallest problems and then uh, focus on how, how we grow uh, crafty small things 
to uh, craftier large things. Right, so I'd like to give a, a quick demo. Uh, yeah, okay, everything seems to be visible. Uh, this is me at a terminal, I'll just run Guile, and Guile starts up, I need to make the font a little bit smaller so that everything fits. Okay, so our, our easiest problem would be like, uh, oh hi polyconf, oh hi, right? So that, <laughs> hello world. And uh, we, we can move on, uh, Lisp is, uh, uh, Guile is a scheme, and scheme is a Lisp, which means that our next example must start with an open parenthesis. And since we've been hearing so much about the uh, origin of, of computation in the lambda calculus, we might as well continue with uh, lambda, which is just a funny way of introducing a function. It can be off-putting if it's not the word you normally associated with functions, but if you just translate lambda to function in your mind, every time you see it, you're, you're good, right? So here we have uh, maybe you know, an argument list, let's say lambda of x, and then uh, return maybe like uh, times x2, right? And, and so here is a function, right? And functions are, are values too. And I could stop here, right? Because lambda is all we need. <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, Turing complete and, and we have enough to express all kinds of programs. But obviously, we want to build uh, more facilities that, make, uh, that are closer to the problems we want to solve on top of this. Uh, so uh, we need maybe more data types. We have strings. Uh, Guile has numbers, of course, uh, but like, numbers like so we have fractions as well uh, we can add like a half and two-thirds and you get seven six like you know so it's, it's real numbers are not and our integers are integers they aren't limited at a certain size if you try to in, um, increment two to the 52 you get two to the 52 plus one not what you get in, in other languages whose numbers are only floating point numbers which is uh, the same number again um, which is, which is a strange thing, maybe, maybe you aren't aware of that. So uh, we can also add definitions. Uh, so uh, our previous function which we gave uh, doubles a number. So we could say define double lambda x times x2. Okay, we've given it a name, no, no, no value. But if we access it by name, okay, of course it's there. Uh, and there's a shorthand for this because you always want to be defining functions. So uh, if I say define, double of x, I get to remove all the lambda bit because it's just uh, syntactic sugar. And it's, it's literally syntactic sugar. So uh, here we have uh, numbers, um, procedure calls. You can see in like the plus one and two, the first element of the list is the procedure, right? So it, if I just type plus, I, I actually get the procedure for plus. Uh, I have uh, lists as well. Some data needs to be quoted because otherwise if I made a list of one, two, three, four, five, then it would treat one as the procedure, right? So we don't want that, we, so we want to quote this list, and you quote it with a single quote in the beginning. And then from there we can move on to, let's say, our usual map function, which is one of the standard ones that's defined in Guile. So we can map double over our list, one, two, three, four, five, and we get you know, our, our result here. And so now you know enough scheme to be completely dangerous, right? You know, go out and, and, and make, some, make some programs. But we need, to, we need to grow things a bit, right? And we need to grow things uh, with a, a bit better environment. This is part of a print from Marc-Andre Rubo uh, in a book called The Art of Joinery, or The Art of the Joiner, um, from 1769. And, and what joiners or, or carpenters or people who make furniture work on workbenches. And workbenches are not like just tables, right? So you see these people are doing different things. But on the tables, if you look closely, there are vises to hold the work. There's holes to put different things in. There's uh, this holding bit that the, that the third fellow over has uh, clamping his work down. And so what we have in Guile is that the REPL is our workbench. And to illustrate this, then um, I'll just add a bogus entry to the end of my list and we'll see what happens. Well, Guile the workbench uh, says, okay, you got an error, right? And furthermore, I'm putting you in the context of the error, which is this, this one here saying, this is, uh, you know, you're in the error and you, okay, you can type BT for a backtrace. So I do get a backtrace and I can see what's going on inside this. I can change to a uh, different frame. This is frame three. I can list the local variables. And this is how we you know, build our programs 
incrementally. In this case, I'm just gonna, uh, I could do control or comma quit to quit, or I could um, control D, which is the, the hacker way to do that. So uh, in addition to uh, being able to just examine the state of an error in a nice uh, conversational way, uh, we have other tools as well. You can profile directly from the REPL, you can disassemble things you compile, you can set breakpoints, you can time things, you can do macro expansions, see what the optimizer will do, and, and most importantly, you can get help on, on what the available things are. So the workbench, the REPL is what, what's gonna let us you know, build up some, some smaller, take our smaller programs and make, make them a bit bigger. But as you grow from a small program to a big program, how do you do it in such a way that like, you preserve the, the thing that, the craftiness, which is what you care about, that maybe you associate with a small program, how do you preserve that property or, or build that property into a, into a bigger system? How, how do we make craftiness as we add structure? In this regard, a, a little anecdote. This is a, a picture of my garden. Uh, this is the third year I've been gardening. It goes well, it goes poorly, there's many things. And, and I started uh, completely ignorantly, <laughs> as, as you do, you know, just the earth will provide sort of thing. Turns out you, you, need to, you need to do a bit of work. And it turns out as well that there are, there are patterns in gardens that make for good gardens. So one of them is um, if you're designing a garden or planning a garden, I don't know if you need to use the word design, you need to make outdoor rooms. You need to make the space outside into spaces that are on the scale of, of the humans that are going to be there and of, of the use it is going to make. And I'm still working on this. But if we think about this as, as we make our, our programs bigger, uh, we, we also need to compartmentalize our code in, into rooms of a sort that have uh, internal structure that, that let us grow. So the next step up from you know, simple um, calculator style uh, development at the REPL would be uh, doing scripts. And, and I think of modules in a way as like rooms for code, right? They have doors and different um, ways to communicate with the rooms around them. In this case, we're just gonna pull in, uh, using the use modules form, a couple of modules, a, a pattern matcher, uh, which provides match to me, and the web client. So this is a script, which you can put in a file and run as guile, my script, HTTP, whatever, and it, it uses the library facilities to fetch a URL, and it returns, in this case, two results. The response, embodying the headers and such, and the body, uh, if it's a textual content type, that body will be decoded uh, from whatever encoding it was in. And Guile um, is, it, it's an older scheme, uh, so it was started about 1993 or so, but on the, having forked an, an earlier scheme implementation actually, so th this is not like uh, the most new language. Uh, what that means is that you have lots of support for um, maybe some older programming paradigms, and then as we've uh, developed uh, over the past five, 10 years ago, we, we start to bless more um, modern um, facilities. And, and our, our goal is to you know, find a nice facility and include it into Guile, so that usually you're, you don't have to uh, lean really hardly on an external uh, set of, of modules that you can, uh, develop your your solution on top of Guile itself. So POSIX was yesterday's standard, right? And, and it's still super relevant. But the web is really, you know, today's standard. Uh, we can talk different, you know, language formats. And working with XML, I don't know if y'all are closure programmers at all, working on with XML and Lisp is a delight. We, we have SXML for, for working on a very structured way. We can also talk uh, directly to native libraries, uh, we have all support for all file encodings, which is a mess if you've ever had to deal with a system that doesn't have this, and, and, and good support for, for different kinds of data abstraction. And additionally, we have a manual which is hundreds and hundreds of pages long. And that, that's definitely a for better and for worse, but in the end, it's a, it's a for better. <laughs> so, okay, scripts. Scripts, uh, okay, it's just a few pages of code. For, for me, this is what a script means, is a few pages of code it pulls in external libraries that can help it do its job. And a program is, well, okay, it's too big for a script, so I have to break it into different you know, uh, modules and such. And, and so my, my program is now composed of modules and, which relate to each other. I don't think anyone knows what, I, I think a system is um, something on which you need to perform basic science to, 
to determine how it actually works, right? So like operating systems, who knows how they work? We don't know. You have to use strace to like see what it's actually doing at runtime, right? So uh, the first thing we need to do is bridge this gap from, from scripts to, to programs. And we, and we do this in, in a way by, uh, sub modules are our fundamental method for doing this. We need to add more rigidity to the more dynamic language to support more weight, to support more program, to support more domain. We support separate compilation, and that's the usual way for, to deliver uh, a program made of multiple modules. You compile them all separately. They're compiled to a bytecode for our custom virtual machine. And uh, as you compile, the, compile can, the compiler can detect many common errors in your code. So in Python, for example, it's, it's quite irritating when you, have, when you type a variable and it's not a variable which is in scope, right? Because the compiler doesn't tell you anything about this, at least when I was using Python last. Guy will do this. It will also tell you if you call a function with a keyword which is not part of that function's keyword, uh, keyword list, you can add more keyword arguments to functions to help you migrate interfaces to add new functionality. And, and you can uh, migrate your users also off of existing functionality using deprecation, which can give you messages both the first time you use something at runtime or at compile time or, or, or other, other facilities. So we have these um, uh, ways of, of, of taking your, your scripts and, and going to programs. But sometimes you, you think like, well, what, what is scripting and, and what is a scripting language? And I, I think it's, a, I, I think it's a, a fallacy of language space design. I think it's what, what you mean in practice when you say something is a scripting language is that it's sloppy, right? That you can add together strings and numbers and that it's slow. Meaning that, well, you have to move to some other language to uh, actually build your program if you need uh, performance in certain aspects. And I think this category of language is, is going to completely go away. We're not going to talk about scripting languages anymore, and, and practically we don't, right? We're going to talk about languages that we want to use to, to build solutions, and it's just languages, right? So in Guile, the, my focus, uh, and it's actually how I started in maintaining Guile, I had a program that was slow. Nobody was writing the compiler. <laughs> we actually had an interpreter back then, a, a simple tree-based interpreter, which we had convinced ourselves, um, lying to ourselves. It was like, oh, it's very optimized. You know, we have a very optimized interpreter. We've been working on this interpreter for a long time. I, I, I don't believe this. Th this is. We had convinced ourselves that this was true, and it, and it completely wasn't. Like programs are written on Guile 1.8 and earlier were very slow. So in 2.0, we introduced a compiler for a virtual machine. And in the last uh, three years or so, I've been working on uh, bringing that up to speed, where the current system is you can allocate seven or 800 megabytes a second. I measured that on this machine. You can retire bytecode instructions at you know, four or 500 million a second, which is OK for a bytecode virtual machine. It starts up pretty snappy, right? Eight milliseconds, nine. And, and the memory usage is, is not that bad. And the, the memory usage is minimized by using ELF as our compiled object format. On any platform, we always emit ELF when we compile our code. And the ELF, uh, this is a map of uh, binary, uh, the compiled HTTP module. And the big blue part uh, at the top is the code. And then the, which part is it? Following that is the read-only data segment. And then the gray part after it is the, the bits that actually have to be mutated when the, when the relinked at runtime. So when you load up the web module, you can share memory between all of your processes which are using Guile for this first blue and orange bit. And then it's only the pieces which, are, which have to be um, relocated at runtime, which is this gray bit, this data bit, which have to actually be stored per process. So you can have many Guile processes running on a machine and, and the memory impact is not very much. But then, okay, Andy, what are, you're talking to me about like these instruction retire rates and stuff, that's, that's trash, right? So what, give, give me some numbers. Well, okay, all right. So I, I'm a compilers person. I've, I've worked on V8, I've worked on SpiderMonkey, I, I work in the widget now, but not on it. Um, and, and micro benchmarks are incredibly perilous. So all the caveats here. I know what's happening in this C micro benchmark and I know what's happening in this C micro benchmark. And I haven't programmed Python in a long time, but I understand this is the way to just increment a number in, in Python 3. And what I'm aiming at, um, at evaluating here is simply, if I have to write my whole program in this language, which is what I want to do, right? I don't want to have to structure my program around calling out to 
C or Rust or some other language in order to be able to, to do my domain. I want to be responsible for my domain, and I want to implement it in, in the language that I prefer. Well then, what's, what's the general sort of uh, throughput that I can expect? So here we're, we're iterating up to a billion in Python 3. This is the way to do it um, sort of naturally in Scheme. Uh, th this, this, is, uh, this syntax is called named let. What it does is it makes a function LP, and it calls it, it has one argument, i, and the initial value for this argument is zero. And you can see it does a loop there. And that gets compiled to like directly a loop because it's a tail call, we have tail recursion. We don't have any like um, loop, there are some standard looping uh, facilities, but they're all defined as macros. So the compiler does not have any uh, representation of a loop inside it, except where the optimization passes need to detect that. Okay, um, right, so the numbers. I ran this on, this is again my machine, about a year old or so, um, and I, I see that in Python 3, each iteration takes about 80 cycles, 80 machine cycles on this machine, which is about, what, 25 uh, nanoseconds or something like that. Is that right? I think that's right. Because I, I converted from nanoseconds to cycles at some point. In any case, we'll say it's 80. In Guile uh, 2.0, okay, we're about even with Python, right? Which is okay for, my first compiler, <laughs> right? And in Gal 2.2, uh, we can see that we're actually, you know, we're starting to do some good optimization at this point. We're down to 12.1. Well, what does this mean in an absolute sense? What is, what, what is the theoretical maximum here? How much slower is my program going to be in Guile? What domain can I not reach because of the performance uh, in Guile? Well, okay, we can compare to GCC. If I compile it with no optimization with GCC, I get about 5.66 cycles per, Iteration, and I looked at the assembly, and it's not very good assembly, so it's maybe not a fair comparison. The real fair comparison is uh, uh, the very tightest loop in assembly you can get, which is just the three instructions, add, test, branch, and that's what GCC01 gives me, uh, and that's down to dot eight cycles per iteration, which um, on, on, if you're really looking for high performance on, on modern computers, you need to measure instructions per cycle. And if you can get that to up to about four or so, which is the maximum for most machines, then you're doing very well, right? And, and that's what GCC is doing here. It gets up to 3.7 IPC, instructions per cycle. So we're about a factor of maybe uh, 15 or so off from you know, a theoretical maximum. Well, GCC 0.2 um, optimizes out the loop entirely. Thanks, <laughs> GCC. That's not what I meant to test. So, so that's a zero there. Divide by zero error. Okay. So what's, what's next, what's gonna you know, let Guile bridge the gap to like, you can really write your entire you know, JPEG decoder or, or what have you in it. I actually wrote a JPEG decoder in Guile and it decoded that uh, Roibo image, uh, uh, Rubo, uh, uh, before. Uh, so I, I can do that anyway, but it's not as fast as, as a C JPEG decoder. Well, we're gonna do some native compilation for the next version of Guile. And I think you can never promise these things, right? You never know how the future is gonna go but I really want to do it. <laughs> so I think it's going to be maybe another two years, three years, something like that before we have a, a Guile, which will be within a factor of two or three from uh, GCC 01. So, well, I'm making up you know, things about the future, all the caveats, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are some ways though that we are not going to try to chase uh, GCC's performance. Like GCC um, compiled binaries have a very, fast uh, error uh, mode where you, know, you don't throw a backtrace or you don't throw an exception or anything. You, you corrupt memory and you leak your user's secrets and, and everything. So Guile uh, will reach, well, our, our goal is to provide like, good speed, but, provide, but with, no, with no escape hatches in the compiler system that will make your safe code unsafe, right? We're gonna preserve safety through the whole thing. Uh, and if, if your single core performance is not good enough, we have pthreads. Right? You can use all the cores on your system. It's a little bit of Wild West. Uh, <laughs> there are ways to crash your guile in, in this regard. Uh, and if you want to isolate a bit more, you can use processes. Um, we are improving our, our thread story. It's gonna be definitely a, a story, a focus for the next year or so. But I, I know, I know, I can't. is it web scale, right? Like can't, how, how many requests a second can it handle? It, all these things. Well. To answer this question, I, I can answer it now, but that's not very good talk drama, right? 
So I'm going to divert the discussion entirely towards a different area. And so I want to talk about um, tools which Gal has that can let you do things that you cannot do in most other languages. And these tools which can let your program grow are macros and prompts. And we've seen a lot of languages with macros today, actually. So I should revise that statement by saying it's a, a wonderful facility pioneered by the Lisps and the Schemes of the world, which is now seeing adoption of other languages, and that's great. I support every one of y'all. And the other thing is prompts. And how many of y'all have heard of prompts? Just like a question out there. One, nine, one, good. How about delimited continuations, if I use the, the bad name? OK, 10, OK. Very good. So we should see a new thing. So the first thing will be, uh, oh man, five minutes. How are we going to do this? Macros let you define a language cut to fit. You wear the clothes that fit you. And it allows you to boil down boilerplate. You will have no boilerplate in the system with the correct use of macros. All the patterns which require boilerplate can have an appropriate macro uh, to express that pattern. And that can be uh, pattern matching, not only over native data, but also data you receive from the database or something. You can write custom pattern matchers for that. Constructors, where you know the types of the fields, you can do some nice tricks there. Decorators, etc. Okay, let's move on though. Prompts. So, story time. Uh, <laughs> in your system, when you run a program, you have the part on the left, which is the system, and the part on the right, which is the program you're running. And they're delimited by a prompt. And I use uh, the percent sign here, because that's a TCSH prompt, and it inspired uh, a formulation of this in, in Guile. Uh, and patterns like delimits between system and user can be specifically captured in languages, like try and catch. The, the body of a try is, in some sense, user code. And, a, and the code outside the try and in the catch is, in some sense, system code. And languages can allow you to put this barrier in your program somewhere. Well, prompts and Gile scheme allow us to do three things. They allow us to do early exit, and our exceptions are built on delimited continuations, or prompts. They allow us to do coroutines, and they allow us to do non-determinism, and I'm not gonna talk about the last one. So the first thing is going to be early exit, and I'm gonna show you prompts first. You use the module uh, containing this macro, which says prompts, and so I use the ice nine control module, and a prompt starts with the prompt, because in Lisp, everything starts with the, the verb of sorts. And then the next term is the body of the prompt, which is like the body of the try in some ways. And then the final term is the handler, which is if the body aborts in some way, then control will be unwound back to the prompt and then we run the handler, right? Okay, seems, seems okay. That expression which I showed actually is a macro and expands out to this, um, almost this. It, it uses a default tag. I'm, here I'm making a new prompt tag. So first thing I do is I do a let of uh, tag, which is our new fresh object. It's a fresh prompt tag. And I use that tag to identify this prompt. Uh, call with prompt is a primitive in Guile. It has support in, in Guile's virtual machine. So we establish a prompt, which is like establishing um, a, a prompt at your uh, shell. And we run the body, which is uh, a lambda expression containing the, the body. And if it aborts, it aborts to the handler. And this is, there's no special syntax here. Uh, it's only that call with prompt is primitive in, in Guile. And so how does this even work? You know, what does this even mean? Well, let's, to take an example of our body, let's say we're, uh, our body is now plus three, and then the other add end, or the other operand to add, is now abort to prompt. Uh, and we're aborting to the prompt named with tag. And we abort with a value. And so that value ends up being the second argument, and I'll get to why in a minute, to the handler. And in the handler, it's named early return val in this example. And in the handler, we just return it. So effectively, we have an early exit with a value. And that, that's something we built using like sticks, you know? But this is definitely like a pattern you wanna, um, you wanna abstract into you know, some other facility. So here's a macro. I'm gonna make a module. I'm defining my, my, my module. I import ice 9 control and I export with return, which is our new macro. And it's actually called something else in Guile. So the first bit after the defined syntax rule, which defines my macro, is the pattern for the macro. So it goes with return, then the identifier for the return, and then the body. And the dot, dot, dot says you can have more expressions after that. And I expand out to the exact same thing. But the interesting thing is that I define a function called return inside there. And because that identifier comes from the pattern, it will be in scope in the body. 
And the body uh, just does whatever it does, but if it calls the return function, it will return back. And here we show that actually in Guile, you can return multiple values from any call in the same way that you can provide multiple values when you make a call, multiple function arguments. So here would be an example of the use. I use it, uh, and I say plus three, return 42, and I return 42. And if I try to like, I can act, it's a first class value, I can map it, and it depends on whether map calls its function on the first or the last, or, or which argument first as to which value will be returned from, from this function. In this case, it's one. All right. So what about that k? You know, what about that first argument? Well, uh, it is a continuation. What does that mean? It, it is the rest of the body wrapped up as a function you can call. And it's the rest of the body, but only until the prompt. It doesn't capture anything else, right? So here I'm aborting to the prompt. It's the same example as before. But I return the continuation. I don't abort with the value. I just return k, the continuation. And so that k is just a function. I can call it, right? Uh, so I call it with 1, and I get plus 3, 4. And I call it with 2, and I get plus 3, 5. And that's kind of confusing. It might be easier to see it if you uh, express it actually as a lambda, because it's entirely equivalent. That k, which I captured, is exactly the same as lambda x plus 3x. And so this is much more understandable. But this is a facility in your language that lets you uh, suspend the computation and then start it again. Well, that's what you need for asynchronous I.O. This works across function call boundaries. You don't need to recast your functions as being of type async t. Whenever an I.O. operation would block, you can suspend it. And then whenever that I.O. operation would resume, you can resume it. And there's no need to adapt like your parser, which operates on uh, synchronous operations on a port, doing character by character oper uh, operations. That just works, but asynchronously. When you suspend, Guile can do other things. This is a somewhat new facility that uh, hasn't been incorporated into core Guile yet. Uh, but it, it's also going, it's, it, it's possible to implement as a library, which is a super interesting thing. And that's what we're going to be doing also over the next year or so. So you get to write straightforward network code. There's nothing async in this at all besides the fact that, OK, run server. I accept a connection, and then I spawn a thread to serve the client. And then I loop. And in the client, I read a line. This is a ping server. And if it's EOF, I just exit. And if it is a line, I echo it back to the, to the client. And it, it just runs asynchronously. You can have you know, tens of thousands of connections, because the implementation we have of this is ePoll underneath. And so it's totally web scale. So that, that answers that question. The ping test, the performance is around 50,000 requests a second or so. And for an HTTP test involving full parsing of the HTTP headers to Guile data types, so that you know you're always working on values that are you know, properly typed, it's about 10,000 requests per core, or requests per second per core. So pretty good, uh, not like you know, 200,000 requests per second way, but you know, it, it's pretty OK. Right? So it's a work in progress. There's more to do. We don't have a channels facility yet. We get to build this in user space, which is super rad. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing that. There's no like, ability to list the threads right now, or fairness, or all kinds of things. But this is where we're going in the future. So finally, you want to deploy your application. And uh, the story here is, is pretty complicated. Uh, and I'm just going to breeze by this. But I think the story we're going to be developing now uh, is saying, use Geeks. And Geeks is, like, is a functional package manager. It's like Nix. It's written in Guile Scheme. You can deploy to bare metal. You can deploy virtual machines or containers or, or many things. So Godspeed with Guile. Thank you for, for having me talk. We have a beautiful website now. And then we're still kind of old school, so we have IRC and not Slack. But it's nice folks, so come, come and see. Come and see us and, and share what you make. So thank you very much. So Scheme is known to be a pretty cool language, but it's also uh, quite dated. And uh, when compared to, for example, to Clojure, you notice that uh, those uh, most important core uh, functions, like you know, like, like uh, map, they cons they consume and they return uh, linked lists. And linked lists with uh, the inter introduction of CPU caching, they kind of aged uh, poorly uh, and other 
any plans because you you talked about performance to get around it like you could steal transducers from closure uh, or something like that um that, that's a good question um uh so i've actually worked in this area and i i can't get anything faster than the garbage collector i have used lots of closure like data structures in guile and oddly the garbage collector is super fast it's very difficult to uh, improve on the simplicity of a sim simple linked list implementation for something like map. But your point is super valid. Gal is not only lists and pairs and stuff. We have lots of data structures. And it, when it matters for your domain, like those things are, are there for you. It could be that there's some impedance mismatches and, and nothing's a panacea. But I don't think that the fact that um, Guile, Guile is a scheme and scheme is a lisp and Lisp is a lang lambda calculus, you know, means that we have all the problems that we had in 1946. I didn't mean to be rude. I, I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, I was actually a bit curious about um, with the delimited continuation, it looked like that was effectively like very similar to maybe common Lisp's uh, conditional restart system. So the ability to actually um, not unwind the stack and resume from the point of computation where something was thrown. Is that, is that equivalent? It's not equivalent uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I don't understand with restart entirely, uh, but prompts are a facility which you can use to implement uh, other control primitives. Um, so I believe with restart, it, it, it installs a special handler and you jump back and you give it new arguments, but you can't capture a, a general, um, you can't suspend a computation and then uh, resume it in the future. So prompts provide those uh, two early exits, so that's one of them, and, and, and you can build with restart if you have early exit, but then you can't build uh, suspendable computations unless you have unimplementation of continuation somehow. And that could be because you've transformed your code to, to be in what's known as continuation passing style, where you can just uh, capture the continuation a, as a variable, but it requires a full, um, complete transformation on the entire program to do that. And then the neat thing about delimited continuations or, or prompts and guile is they, they can do it uh, preserving uh, separate compilation and, 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 and any old code in, in the middle. The only caveat is that you can't have a C stack frame captured by that delimited continuation. And that's been a, a big issue in Guile. We had to rewrite a lot of stuff from C in Scheme, not only because C is Tote's legacy, uh, but also because you know, we want to be able to do these cool new things. And, and that means you know, having them in, in Scheme so that we can rewind the stack. OK, let's give a round of applause to Andy.